Frank, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Uh, Frank's wife, Tara, is right here on the front row, so we are so glad you guys are here with us today. Um, yes, welcome. Um, they have five children, so uh, we are finally, we have finally, the Webbers have finally been eclipsed. If, uh, if, if this is the Lord's direction and will, that's a, that's a good thing for us, but we are really glad to, glad to worship with you guys today. And uh, they have been serving and ministering um, in California and, uh, and have been in Florida prior to that and Indiana, and we're just uh, really honored to worship with you uh, at this time. And we're really glad you're here too. Uh, if you're a first time guest with us, especially again, let me just say welcome to you. We're really, really honored for you to be with us today. Uh, and we hope before you leave that you'll stop by the landing right outside these doors and let us connect with you. We've got a gift we'd love to give you. Also, if you haven't already, just text, connect, or text the letters VIP to 904-441-8650. That will help us connect with you and uh, give you some information about how you might be able to connect with us and the ministry here at, at Southside Baptist Church. Uh, we are in a series about faith and politics. Now, if you're here and you didn't know that, you may be tempted right now to get up and leave. Please don't, okay, please don't. Um, hang around at least through this message and then you can decide maybe if you're gonna come back for the next few weeks during this series. But we are in a series on faith and politics. I try to do this uh, every four years during the presidential election just to help us understand what is important, what does the Bible have to teach us about these issues that dominate the media and seem to be so important because they are important, but we need some perspective. And so we try to, we try to do that by going to God's Word and saying, what does it teach us about this? Now, the series is called Jesus 2020, and the reason we picked that title is more than just the year, but because so often for so many of us, we tend to see the world and understand the world and understand God through the lens of politics, through the lens of what is going on in culture. When in fact as believers, and I know not everybody here is a believer, not everybody here is a follower of Jesus Christ, but for those of us who are, um, we are really called to view the world through the lens of Jesus. We're not asked to evaluate the teachings of Jesus based on the way the world looks at Jesus, but we're asked instead to evaluate everything, our politics, the way we live our life, everything through the lens of Jesus. So this series really is about how do we do that? How do we look at the political situation? How do we look at our current circumstances through the lens of Jesus? And we started out last week by talking about the fact that even though it feels like we live in the most divided times, maybe in our lifetimes, but maybe ever, the truth is uh, this is nothing new. This is part of the human condition. Uh, this division and this hatred and animosity that seems to flare up so quickly, it's part of the human condition. In fact, Jesus, among his own disciples, had two disciples who were from very different political perspectives. And so we looked at Simon the Zealot, who was on the extreme right of the politics of his day, and Matthew, who was on the extreme left of the politics of his day, and Jesus called both of them to be his disciples. And they both followed Jesus. How did he do it? How did Jesus manage that? Well, first of all, because he encouraged all of his followers to do something so simple, so simple, but so incredibly powerful, that if the church today would do this, I am convinced not only would it change the conversation in our church, it would change the conversation in our nation. And it is simply this, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then trust him to handle everything else. Rather than putting politics first, rather than putting an agenda first, put, put his kingdom first. And we said, what does that mean? Well, it can mean a lot of different things, but two things in particular that Jesus really stressed in his teaching. One was unity, and the other was love. Loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Loving your enemy enough. Loving people the way he loved us, and that meant he laid down his life for us. So doesn't it just stand to reason that if Jesus would lay down his life for us and call us to follow him, that it might mean that we might have to lay down our political perspectives for somebody else? Come on, right? And here's the thing, are we as a church, are we as Christians, are we as people who follow Jesus? Again, if you're not a Christian, you're off the hook. You don't have to listen to this. But if you are a Christian, doesn't it stand to reason, are we really willing, are we really willing to sacrifice the eternal kingdom principles for temporary political opinions? Because political opinions change. Your political opinions have changed. The political parties have changed. And so we want to say, what, how can we look on these things from the perspective 
of Jesus. So for the next three weeks, this week and the next two, we're actually going to take a statement out of our Declaration of Independence because this statement is attributed to God. The, the, the writers of the Declaration of Independence say that God gave us all this, these rights, rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? Happiness. So we're going to look at each of those for the next three weeks, and today we're going to start out with this idea of, of life. What does it mean that God gave us this idea of life? How does, how does looking at this through Jesus' perspective help us to see things? First thing you need to know, and you already know this, but it's probably worth just all of us being on the same page, is that politicians need us to believe that our very lives and the quality of our lives depend on their election, don't they? I mean, isn't that part of every campaign? And if it's not just about the fact that, hey, my policies and my leadership are what's going to guarantee your life and, and, and your, the quality of your life, it's also that that guy over there is going to kill you. Like, he's going to take grandma, and he's going he's to kill grandma, and he's going to kill your dog, and he's going to, I mean, whatever it is, right? So it's not just about, hey, I need you to know that I am going to make your life better, but it's that my opponent is going to make your life worse, now, this idea really, I think, helps. We, we really can understand a perspective on this by looking at something Jesus taught in a passage of Scripture that you can find in your Bibles in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Now, this is not a passage of Scripture that you might be ever have, ever have looked at before and said, hey, this really has something to say about politics, but I think it actually has something very important for us as believers when it comes to how we think about politics. Politics. So I want us to look at John chapter 10 together as we consider this. And we're going to look at three things in particular as we read this passage. First of all, why we need leaders. Because we do, right? We need leaders. Why do we need leaders? And the second thing is the threat that we face from following the wrong leaders. And then the third thing that we're going to see in this passage is the test of a true leader. Okay, so why we need a leader, the threat we face from following wrong leaders, and then finally the test of a true leader. Now, if you're a note taker, you can go to our website, ssbc.org slash tools, and there's an outline there. Uh, there's also a reading plan if you want to uh, do in your own personal study this week, kind of follow up with some passages, and there's a discussion guide that you can use on your own with your family in a small group. All that's available at ssbc.org slash tools. Let's look at this. John chapter 10, verse 1 through 18. Uh, there's a Bible in front of you. We'll also put it on the screens. Let's look at this together. John chapter 10, verse 1 through 18. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, and here's what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought them out, he, he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Now this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. To which some of you are like, yeah, I have no idea. What did that just mean? Sheep? Doors? Gates? I mean, what are we talking about here? Hang on, just st stick with him just a little bit longer. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not in this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. 
This is the word of the Lord. So let's take a look at this. The first thing we can see in this passage is why we need a leader. Why we need a leader. And the answer is pretty simple. And and it may be obvious, especially I think the older you are and the more you see just people living their lives and the decisions they make. We are all like sheep, and sheep have to have a shepherd. Sheep do not do well on their own. In fact, they don't really survive at all on their own. We are like sheep, and sheep have to have a shepherd. This is why we need a leader. Let me give you three examples in the Bible, because it's not just Jesus who referred to us as sheep. The Bible refers to us as sheep from the beginning all the way to the end. And I'm just going to give you three quick examples. The first one is, uh, is Matthew. Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus said this, When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 700 years before Jesus, the prophet Isaiah said this, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. Can you all relate to that? I mean, has there been a time, a season in your life where you have gone astray, you wandered away? Maybe you meant to. You did it on purpose. Maybe you didn't mean to. But whether you meant to or you didn't, you wandered away, you found yourself in trouble. You know why that's true? Because we are all like sheep, and we are sometimes bad sheep. Oh, my family, none of my family's here today, so <laughs> otherwise I would have looked over and seen my wife looking at me and known immediately not to go there, but we've all like sheep gone astray. Psalm 23, you know this psalm, the Lord is my, what does that mean? What does it mean if the Lord is my shepherd? It must mean that I am a sheep. I am a sheep. The Bible refers to us this way over and over again, and sheep need shepherds. Why? Because there are two qualities of sheep that you need to understand. Sheep, first of all, are vulnerable. Vulnerable. They're vulnerable because they have no natural defense. They're not fast. They're not strong. They have no defense against any predator that would come and con- to try to consume them. And they, they also aren't very smart. You know this is true about all of us, right? I mean, people individually, they can be really smart. You put them in a group and people just start acting silly. I mean, they just don't, we don't even really understand why do people make that decision? Why did they do that? And all you have to do is look back on your own track record and look back in your own past. You say, I can see times I did that. Why did I make that decision? Sheep are vulnerable, but listen, sheep are also valuable. They're valuable. In fact, in Jesus' day, they were one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable commodity. They provided not only clothing but they provided meat and food that sheep were incredibly valuable are incredibly valuable and so when God speaks about us when he talks about us in terms of us being sheep and him being our shepherd you need to know what that means it means one that you are vulnerable no matter how smart you think you are no matter how powerful you think you are you are vulnerable it takes 10 minutes for your whole world to be turned upside down For all the money that you have been considering as your source of security to be gone, for your health to be gone, for your relationships to come to an end, for the job to be gone, it happens like that. You are vulnerable, but you are also incredibly valuable. So much so that Jesus, our good shepherd, would leave the 99 to pursue you when you are lost. That he does not give up on finding the sheep because he knows the sheep are vulnerable and they are valuable. Now, part of this reality about how we've been made, God designed us for this desire, this instinctive desire for leadership that we need it. But something happened inside of us that corrupted that desire to be led into a desire to rule and to dominate. We looked at it a little bit last week, but if you go back, and we're not going to turn there today, but if you go back and look at Genesis chapter 3, what you find is God gave Adam and Eve dominion over the earth. They were to steward and shepherd everything on the earth, but they themselves only had one leader, and that was God himself. God was their leader. He said, you have one rule, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But we know the story. They did it anyway. They ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what does that mean? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. It basically means it gives us the power to determine and judge for ourselves what is right and wrong. That God, we don't trust you to determine what is right and wrong. We will make the decision what is right and what is wrong. And here's the problem. The minute we 
make our decision that we're going to live according to our self-will, that we can decide better for ourselves and for others what is right and wrong, then the minute our opinions conflict, then one of us has to dominate the other one. You see it played out at the very first relationship between Adam and Eve. What were the consequences of sin? Well, one of them is that God said to Eve, hey, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over over you. In other words, you're going to desire to control him, but he's going to rule over you. And you see the, fir- the seeds of marriage problems right there. But it wasn't just about marriage. It was about every human interaction that ever existed. That there is this innate desire inside of us to dominate and control. That our judgment, our determination is right. And if yours doesn't align with mine, then you must be wrong. Which means one of us is going to have to dominate and rule the other. And this is how the problem came in. And you see it continue on in the nation of Israel. As the nation of Israel is growing and as they're coming in uh, out of Egypt where they've been held in, in, in bondage and they're going into the promised land, they did not have a king. There were prophets, there were priests, there were judges. God continued to provide for them. God continued to protect them. And you see this nation. It's, it's unlike any other nation around it. All the other nations had kings and rulers. But this nation somehow managed to, to take possession of the land and to thrive and succeed without a king. But they looked all around and they saw how all the other nations had kings. So they went to Samuel, the last judge, and they said, Samuel, we need a king. And Samuel's like, you really don't want that. Like, no, 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 we need a king. We want to be like everybody else. We want to put somebody in power and authority over us. Why? Because there's a desire, an innate need inside of us to be led. We need to be led. And so God told Samuel, Samuel, they've not rejected you as their leader. They've rejected me as their leader. They've rejected me. And and listen, because... We're in a political season. We're about to elect a new leader. And listen to me, Christians especially, listen to me. The process of putting your trust in any human ruler is also the beginning of the process of not putting your trust in God. The minute you are beginning to place more confidence and trust in any ruler, king, president, governor, mayor, the minute you begin to put more trust in that person, it means that you are putting less faith and confidence and trust in God. That's been the pattern and the model throughout the entire scripture. If you think our only hope hope is Donald Trump or Joe Biden, your hope is not in Jesus Christ. The reverse of that is also true. If you have an irrational fear about the election of one of these two men, then your hope is not in Jesus Christ. Because neither of these two people can do for your soul what your soul needs which is to be shepherded, neither of them are able to do that. The best of the kings, the best politicians, the best form of governments cannot do what our soul needs and longs most for because only God can do that. That brings us to the second thing, the threat we face from following the wrong leaders. Now, this passage talks about two specific kind of leaders that are wrong the first kind are bad leaders look what it says in john 10 verse 1 truly truly i say to you he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way that man is a thief and a robber okay so this is the bad guy in verse 10 he talks about it more he says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy in another passage uh, matthew chapter 7 verse 15 and 16 jesus said this watch out for false prophets Because they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Now we could spend a whole morning just on that idea. But what's the point? The point is, there are bad leaders. Jesus points to them. And their purpose is to kill and steal and destroy. But it's not just bad leaders, because they're also incompetent leaders. Look what he says in uh, John 10, verse 12 and 13. He who is a hired hand... And not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand, and he cares nothing about the sheep. Now, the incompetent leader or the hired hand is not necessarily bad. It's just that the incompetent leader is not the leader who's going to do what we need to have done because he's not capable. He's not capable of doing it. And and come on, listen. Isn't it true? Isn't it true? That no matter who gets elected on November 3rd, that person is only going to be in office for at most four, maybe eight years. I mean, maybe. I mean, 
Isn't it true that even if you think if you put all your hope in whoever the, election, the winner of the election is going to be, that that person at best is a hired hand for a temporary period of time? And even if we had lifetime appointments, lifetime appointments for president, isn't it true that that person would only be in office as long as they lived? Every leader we have is limited by their own mortality. Therefore, they are not able to shepherd you for eternity. And God has placed eternity in your heart. There's a longing inside of you that goes long past your lifespan. I've talked to some of our senior adults. And you're concerned about this nation. You're concerned about the election. And you know that you may not even live to see the end of this next presidential term. But you've got kids and grandkids. And so don't our hopes and dreams go long beyond just the temporary leadership of any person that we might elect? And see, every one of those people can only serve for a limited period of time. Even when they are at their best, they are most, at most, just a hired hand. They cannot do what needs to be done. And so this has caused many to say, well, you know, is 2020 really just a choice between bad and incompetent? I mean, right? Come on. I mean, is it just a choice between bad and incompetent? A choice between two, lesser, uh, lesser of two evils? I think this misses the point, and this is really where I want to drive it home for us today, because this is really where I feel like God has really been speaking to me lately. If you buy into that lie, if you buy into the myth of somehow thinking that the problem is one candidate or the other, then you may be missing the more dangerous and sinister work that's happening right now. Because I want to talk to you about who the real enemy is. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. This is so critical and it's connected so well to this idea when we talk about the danger of following the wrong leader listen to what paul said to the ephesians in ephesians 6 11 and 12 he said this put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand against the schemes of who the devil and we don't really talk about him a lot like i mean we're sophisticated folks right and so we, we just think, you know, like we don't want to be those people that talk about the devil all the time. But C.S. Lewis, of course, said, you know, there are two mistakes we make about the devil. One is to give him way too much credit and the other is to ignore him altogether. And he's happy with either mistake we make. But let me tell you something. There is a real enemy. There is. And listen to what Paul goes on to say. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Church, we better wake up and realize who the real enemy is because there is a real enemy. And what if that enemy is winning the war, not by getting a certain person elected, but by distracting, dividing, deceiving us into believing that one of these guys is our good shepherd and the other is a wolf in sheep's clothing? when in fact, at best, they're both just hired hands. What if the enemy is winning no matter who gets elected because he causes us to be divided against one another? Because he, he inspires us to somehow not love, but buy into the hate. See, isn't this the perfect scenario for the enemy to do his work? I don't think it matters to him who wins. I think as long as people are divided, as long as the church is divided, as long as love is not the rule, he wins every time. And it does not matter who will occupy the White House. We better be careful because we face a real threat from following the wrong leader. There are bad leaders. There are incompetent leaders. But be assured of this, there is an enemy. And he can use either of them to accomplish his purposes. I promise you. So what do we do? The test of a true leader. This passage gives us the test of a true leader. Actually, it gives three indications of our true leader, and I want to just look at these three. First of all, the test of a true leader is that he calls his own by name, and they recognize his voice. Listen to what he says in verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, I, I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. You know, it's amazing to me how how willing we are to sacrifice our reputation as Christians for the name of a political candidate who will never know your name. That you are at best a demographic who is to be one. 
when there is a shepherd who not only knows you, but he formed you. He knit you together in your mother's womb, and he loves you. The test of a true shepherd is that he knows his own by name. And look at this, and I lay down my life for the sheep. That's the second test, that he lays down his life for the sheep. He's willing to sacrifice. He's willing to lay aside power and authority in order to offer life to those who are dying. Verse 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, Jesus said. It's not by trying to take power, but it's by a willingness to surrender. That Jesus, who was in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he laid aside all the authority of heaven and became a servant, taking the form of a servant ultimately laying down his life for us. That's the test of a true leader. See, Jesus, Jesus is not only the one who comes to give us life, Jesus is always for it. And, and I want to give you an example of why as Christians we need to look at this from the perspective of Jesus when it comes to an issue that can be very controversial and very difficult. Jesus is not only the, 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 the one who gives life, he didn't only die for us to have life, he authored it. Kingdom people, listen to me. Neither party has a monopoly on the issue of the sanctity and the value of life. But the shepherd that we follow came to give life. Listen, listen, Democrats, Democrats, listen to me. The sanctity of life when it comes to the unborn is a critical issue from the perspective of the kingdom. But Republicans, listen. The sanctity of life doesn't end with birth. It extends through the life of that person, even the most vile criminal who's on death row today. And I'm going to tell you something, and this is, you can disagree with me, and we can, we can disagree and still love each other because that's what we're commanded to do. But I'm telling you, it is inconsistent for somebody to say they are pro-life to defend the rights of the unborn and at the same time celebrate the execution of a criminal inconsistent and until we as christians are consistent in our belief when it comes to life then we have no credibility on the issue at all and there is not one party or the other that has a monopoly on this issue we have to be consistent in what we believe regardless of where it falls in the party platforms the, the third thing that i think this shows us about a true leader is that he has other sheep. He has other sheep. He is the shepherd for all people, not just one party or the other, but also not just of one nation. Look what he said in verse 16. And I have other sheep that, know, that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd. Okay, this is going to be a shock for some of you. Are you ready? Okay, get ready. Jesus is not a Republican. Jesus is not a Democrat. And Jesus is not an American. And this is really important for those of us who say we're going to put the kingdom first. Come on, this is going to be hard for you. I know, I'm, I'm pushing now. I'm pushing. For those of us who say we follow Jesus and that we have to put kingdom first, we have to recognize that the kingdom first means even kingdom over nation. It must mean that. Because there is a real danger, and I see it more now than ever before, there is a real danger of tribalism among American Christians today. And here's why that's so dangerous. Because that's exactly what you read in the Pharisees and in Jesus' day that Jesus faced. He confronted the national tribalism of his own day. And the church in America today had better realize that our kingdom that we are called to place our allegiance with is much bigger than just one political party and one nation. Jesus' call to Christians was to go into all the world and share the gospel. That's a call to go. See, I think we get so distracted by who's coming in that we miss the real mission of Christians to go. 
We're so concerned about walls and whether or not to have walls and what to do about borders that we've totally ignored Jesus called us said hey go to Jerusalem Judea and to the ends of the earth for the cause of the gospel because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein America is not just God's the whole planet is his and we have to realize that if our vision is so limited to one political party or to one nation then our vision is not big enough to see the God who created all of it and will reclaim and redeem every square inch of the planet this is so critical and i hear christians who are so concerned about in the immigration issue and it's an issue that divides the church today churches that are that are that are for immigration and and, and even illegal immigrants and they have one political opinion people who are against it and for the rule of law and build the wall or don't build the wall and you get all this going on and here here's the thing that here's the thing that is like look at this do you realize that both political parties have used the immigration issue to their advantage they do not want it solved both parties have used it as a weapon against the other how do i know this because both parties within the last few presidential cycles have had power in all both houses of congress and yet they have not done anything about the immigration issue and when we talk about the value of life every human life we're not just talking about at the beginning of life we're not just talking about the end of life we're talking about the value and dignity of lives of even people who cross a border illegally and it should disturb every christian to see mothers and children in cages that is not okay not because we're Americans that is not okay because we are followers of Jesus Christ and let me tell you something the president of one party built those cages and the president of another party put people in them church we got to wake up we've got to wake up and realize that Jesus has called us to a different set of values and it's going to make it it's going to be unpopular it's going to be unpopular with both political parties it's going to be unpopular with both extremes liberals and conservatives but we have to say if we do not defend kingdom values first and foremost who is going to defend them who will stand up for these things so what are we supposed to do because i know some of you are like man he's going to say this every week he's not helping me decide who to vote for he, matter of fact it's making it harder so how should how should kingdom people respond in this election let me give you three things that I think will help as you try to as you try to just deal with this idea of of how to respond in an election like this first of all refuse to believe that either candidate is the good shepherd because they are not they are not they are both flawed imperfect leaders who themselves are in need of a good shepherd can we all just agree that that's true second of all neither man is the real enemy and the real enemy wins by making you think that one of them is the real enemy wins by distracting you and convincing you that one of these two guys is the real enemy let me just tell you something neither of these guys are smart enough to be the real enemy it's just i mean it's just true refuse to believe that either candidate is the good shepherd the second thing recognize where your own party come on now this is really important okay this is really important because i've seen some of your posts on facebook yeah yeah you should probably unfriend me some of you i'm just saying <laughs> recognize where your own party or where your own candidate doesn't measure up to Jesus and seek to influence change from within now you may be a Democrat you may be a Republican you may be liberal you may be conservative but listen what if instead of criticizing the positions of the other person the other party who doesn't align with Jesus what if you instead you just looked inward and said where does my own party where does my own candidate not line up with with the kingdom principles and values what if what if you if, if you're a liberal if you're a democrat what if you just began to challenge your own party when it comes to issues of the sanctity of life and say at some point at some point maybe there's debate maybe at some but can we all just agree 
that life is life? Can we just focus on that? And it may be on the other end. Maybe you would say, hey, in, in my own party, maybe you're a conservative, maybe you're a Republican. Can we all just agree that it's inconsistent for us to say we're for life of the unborn and then advocate for the execution of criminals? I mean, can we just say, let's focus in on our own candidates and our own parties and try to influence kingdom change from within rather than just criticizing the other guy in the other party? Third, look to Jesus. And this is the most important of all. Look to Jesus as the shepherd of your soul. Look to Jesus as the shepherd of your soul. Now, I know this whole series and this message really has focused more on believers than non-believers. I mean, if you're not a believer, I'm really glad you're here and listening. Because I think sometimes maybe the stereotypes in the media would cause you to believe that Christians have, are all of one stripe and one political opinion. It's just not true. But if you, if you are a Christian, let me just say one more thing to you. And then if you're not a Christian, I want to talk to you for a second. If you are a Christian, listen. Your number one allegiance is to follow Jesus and surrender to him. Number one. And come on, if you are not willing to put him and his kingdom values first, would you just do us all a favor and stop telling people you're a Jesus follower? Just go ahead and say you are, you're a full red-blooded Democrat or Republican and just give your allegiance and follow after your political party, but take Jesus out of it. Please take Jesus out of it. Now, if you're not a believer, let me say something to you. Where is your hope? As I have watched the, our community, as I've watched people around the nation and to the extent that you can see through media, the world, I've seen such tremendous fear like I've never seen before. About the pandemic, yes, but also about the election. And, and let me just ask you, if all your hope is in the election of a particular political party or candidate, you will be disappointed. In fact, if you're old enough, you have already been disappointed. At what point are you going to finally realize that there is never going to be a human that you can elect to office, never a political party with a, an agenda that matches up, who is going to solve the ultimate problems in the world? We've been trying it for thousands of years. All kinds of different forms of government, all kinds of different economic systems, all kinds of different people in leadership. And we find ourselves in the same situation, maybe in some ways worse than it was before. Because the problem is at the heart of us, the problem is at the heart of you, at the heart of every single one of us. You were designed and hardwired to follow a leader who will shepherd your soul. Not just for four years or eight years or even the length of your life, but through eternity. Would you just consider for a minute that maybe who you've been looking for isn't going to be on the ballot this November? And his name is Jesus. Candidates, presidents, they're going to come, they're going to go, but Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. Political parties, positions will change, but Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Politicians will seek to use a crisis and use fear to their political advantage, but Jesus laid down his life for you. Will you follow him. I'm going to ask the musicians to come up as we bring, uh, bring this message to a, to a close. I, I just want to leave you with the invitation to follow Jesus. To surrender your political hopes, your political perspectives to Jesus and say, I'm a, kingdom of the, I'm a citizen of the kingdom first before I'm a citizen of the United States, before I'm a member of a political party, the kingdom is first. I surrender all of those things and I commit myself to following Jesus. And if you are not a believer, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, would you just trust Jesus? He has stood when empires and kingdoms have fallen. And he will be here after this election. He will be here after this government is no more. He will be here through time and eternity. 
And he wants to bring you with him into that eternity. He wants to give you life and to give you abundance. Will you surrender to him? Will you stand? And if you're here today and you have never followed Jesus, in your heart of hearts, you could just simply pray this. Jesus, I have wandered away. I am a sheep. I am vulnerable. But Lord, thank you that you recognize the infinite value in me. That you sent Jesus, the good shepherd, who laid down his life for me. Lord, I commit myself to follow him. Lord, I will not be led astray by politicians and kings and political theories that will come in and out of fashion, but I commit myself, I surrender myself to the good shepherd. And I know because he laid down his life for me, his ways are always good. His ways are always right. Lead me to life and lead me to abundant life. Lead me to eternal life. I place my faith in Jesus Christ. For those of you who are Jesus followers, but you have gotten so amped up and charged up and distracted by earthly values, can we just pray together, Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us that like your disciples, it's so easy for us to get distracted by the bright and shiny thing, by the latest argument by the latest political opinion. Lord, draw your church, draw our hearts back to the kingdom and the kingdom principles and the kingdom values. Father, even when it's unpopular, even when we make our own side mad, Lord, help us stand with Jesus and surrender our will, surrender our perspective to the perspective of Jesus. Father God, would you have your way in your church in America? In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a of difficult social strife, in the midst of a contentious election, would you cause your church, God, to rise up above the noise of this world and to proclaim the hope that is only found in Jesus Christ? May we clearly stand with Jesus when all other kingdoms fall and when all other kingdoms fail. May we build our homes. May we build your church on that foundation and would you be glorified in us not in spite of pandemics not in spite of racial strife not in spite of an election but Lord even because of it would you cause us to shine with the radiance and the hope and the message of Jesus Christ Lord we surrender all this to you in his name we pray